Uh, first, I'm going to talk. I'm going to, to say a bit, a few words about her biography. She got her Bachelor of Science from Saint Mary's University in Texas, and in the Adobe major in electrical engineering and applied physics. She got the PhD from Syracuse University in 2018, and then she has been working in, in, in microbrewing experiment, in neutrino experiment. And the, she was a, a, a she had some award from the uh, University of Research Association of Lisbon and the, the Neutrino Fifth Center Fellowship uh, when she was in the PhD. And today she is talking about this G minus two. It is very interesting uh, uh, experiment and her to go to Bush for the G minus two. Uh, uh, Dr. Seska, please come begin. Hi, everybody. Really excited to be here. Sorry if I'm a little uh, frazzled. We just moved into a new home and the mattress guys are delivering our new mattress. So bear with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm super excited to be here. And today we're going to be talking about uh, Fermilab G-2 run one results and essentially the journey, the story on how we got here. So we're going to start off with discussing what G-2 is and what our theory uh, predicts. Uh, then we're going to go into um, muon G-2 at Fermilab and how the muons are made and how we store the muons in our uh, magnetic ring. And then we'll move towards the analysis and what goes into a Wilgo plot. What does it mean by a precision science experiment? Uh, we'll head over to the results and discuss why this is exciting. And then lastly, uh, kind of touch on um, what experiment, experimental updates have been made and um, what could this point to. <clears throat> so before we, before we get there, I wanna just do a primer on what particle physics is so that we're all starting on the same page. <clears throat> so particle physics is the study of the smallest building blocks of uh, the universe and their fundamental interactions. And at Fermilab, we use some of the biggest detectors in the country to study these building blocks. And I like to think of our detectors sort of like a really, really huge microscope peering into the really, really small and unknown. <clears throat> So the periodic table is the scientist's first attempt to catalog everything that we see in nature. Um, but once they started digging, they found out that there was more beneath the surface. And while we know that there are elements like hydrogen and oxygen and carbon, these elements are actually made up of something else. They aren't actually the building blocks that we as particle physicists are interested in. So what are these building blocks? Everything around us is made up of an assortment of protons, neutrons, electrons, and photons. Um, and photons are the light particle. Uh, but there's more to the story. And fortunately for us particle physicists, there is um, a lot more to learn about these ingredients. So now we move towards the standard model. And the standard model is particle physicists' new attempt at trying to catalog the building blocks of the universe. So protons and neutrons are actually made up of something called quarks. And if you discover a particle, you get to name them. And that's how we got a weird name like quarks. Um, and a proton is actually made up of two up quarks and one down quark, while the neutron is made up of two down quarks and one up quark. You also have what we call the leptons, which are right here. Um, and one of them, is considered the celebrity, uh, the electron. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's actually pretty um, ordinary. <laughs> but I, I'd say that I'm biased because I have my, my favorite particles, um, which started off being the muon neutrino. And now as I, um, on G minus two, it's the muon. Um, but let's, let's talk about the, the neutrinos. Uh, these, we call them uh, ghostly particles that are, travel, that are traveling through us right now, and they hardly interact with matter, and they have very, very little mass, and they travel close to the speed of light. So they're really, really pesky and difficult to, to nail down and study, but I think that's what makes them really, really interesting. Um, and just to show you how kind of new 
this field of science is, the tau neutrino right here was actually discovered in 2000. So this isn't like, you know, um, Newtonian mechanics, which was done back in the day. This is really cutting edge, uh, bleeding knowledge type, type information. And I think that's what makes this field super, super exciting. <clears throat> so looking at the standard model, it looks like everything, you know, is buttoned up and uh, we understand everything. But actually, once we started digging, uh, more questions um, popped up rather than answers. And it was kind of like a Pandora, Pandora's box situation, but in a good way. So the standard model essentially makes up everything uh, that we see you know, around us, but actually it only accounts for 5% of the total matter in the universe. Dark matter consists of 27% and dark energy is around 68%. Um, and while we know that dark matter and dark energy exist, we don't actually know what it is yet. Um, so there's a lot of questions that remain like, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? And where does gravity fit in, right? Um, other questions is why is there this mass hierarchy in the standard model? And if I go back, um, these three columns, actually uh, the, the particles get heavier in mass and we don't understand why there's this hierarchy in, in matter. And if there are, you know, more heavier particles, that exist. And then lastly, and I think it's one of the biggest questions, is why is there this matter-antimatter asymmetry? And what that means is that at the beginning of the universe, there are equal parts matter and antimatter that were created. And when matter and antimatter come together, they annihilate each other, they destroy each other. So, you know, we're weird when you think about it. Like, the us, everything that's around us, the matter um, that that survived, you know, from the the Big Bang, is actually an anomaly, and we're trying to understand why that is and how that came to be. So the research at Fermilab um, can be categorized into three frontiers. We have the energy frontier, which focuses on direct searches of new particles. Um, the intensity frontier, which focuses on creating intense neutrino beams or muon beams um, for use in measuring uh, particle properties. And then lastly, we have the cosmic frontier, which focuses on the exploration of the cosmos. <clears throat> and I think what makes muon G minus two super unique is that it sits firmly in the middle of accelerator, nuclear, atomic, and high energy physics. Um, and that makes this the experimental design and the implement implementation really challenging, but also uh, very, very interesting. So now let's get back to the muon and how this particle could be the key to discovering new physics. <clears throat> so muons are abundant. Several muons are going through us right now every minute. They are made by protons from cos cosmic rays smashing into atoms and molecules in our upper atmosphere. Um, they have the same charge and spin as electrons, yet they're different than electrons um, because they're 200 times more massive. Uh, they're unstable, which means they decay into an electron into neutrinos, and they can penetrate material. And because they are heavier, they are more um, sensitive to new and exotic physics. So that's what makes them great probes of the standard model. They're also not affected by the strong force. And relatively speaking, they live for a long time. Um, that's around 2.2 microseconds, which is really, really short, but long enough for particle physicists to study them. And we can make a lot of them. <clears throat> So when you um, put muons in a magnetic field, the muons precess around the magnetic field like you're seeing in this graphic. And this precession is called the G factor. And like I said, it's related to the strength of the magnetic field. So I'm going to try and not show a lot of equations. But this one, if you don't remember any, remember this one. Because this is essentially the equation that encodes the physics behind the G minus 2 experiment. Um, so mu 
is the magnetic moment. <clears throat> S is the spin, and Q and M are the charge and mass of the muon, respectively. And the G factor that we see circled in red here actually encodes the relationship between the strength of the magnetic field and how fast the particle is spinning. And back in the late 20s, this G factor of spin one-half particles was calculated to be equal to 2. So how we use this precession as a probe to be on the standard model physics is by paying very close attention, very, very close attention to how muons process in our magnetic field. So a weird quantum mechanical property is that a particle in a vacuum is never actually alone. It shows up with a posse. It shows up with friends. And we call this... Um, a quantum foam of virtual particles. So a vacuum with a particle in it shows up with this virtual particle kind of posse. And these virtual particles pop in and out of existence. Um, and the more massive a particle is, the, the higher the probability of these quantum fluctuations or this quantum foam to occur. And what the graphic that you're seeing here um, is uh, a random simulated quantum hadronic fluctuations um, in a vacuum, and it, it, it mirrors the type of, you know, uh, quantum fluctuation activity that we're seeing in, in the G minus two experiment. And what this quantum foam does is affects the muon's G factor and the amount that that G factor differs from two is known as the anomalous magnetic moment. So that's what we're trying to get a measurement on. That's what we're trying to get a grasp on is how, how our muons G factor differs because of these fluctuations. So the muon magnetic moment has been a hot topic of physics conversation um, for close to a century. And this is just a really quick rundown of the work that's done so far. So back in 1928, Dirac calculated that G is equal to two for spin one half particles. And um, the first big breakthrough in this was um, when Schwinger calculated the first correction to G. So the first anomalous muon magnetic um, moment was calculated in 1948 by Schwinger, and that correction was alpha over 2 pi. And this was like his crowning glory, so much so that on his uh, um, tombstone, it actually has the, that correction, alpha over 2 pi. Um, so then we move uh, to the Nevis and Liverpool experiments that were done in 57 through 59. And they used a technique where they stopped muons in a target and rotated their spins with a changing B field. And this technique actually showed that there was a parity violation in the weak decay of the muon. And that essentially means that uh, when the muon decays, the positron that comes out of it is preferentially emitted in the direction of the muon spin vector. So that gives us information on how the muon was acting in, in, in the magnetic field. And this, this um, realization is actually the basis of every G minus two experiment after. <clears throat> so then when we we now get to CERNs one through three, and these were done in 1961 through 79, and they used a different technique. Um, what they did was use the difference of the precession frequency and the cyclotron frequency, and we'll talk about those, what those terms mean in a little bit, and they used this difference to pull out that anomalous magnetic moment. Um, and their ring, so they had a ring, um, a, magnet, a, a magnetic ring that created a magnetic field, uh, but their ring was made up of many separate magnets. And this caused a variation in the B field that was created, which meant that the G minus two frequency that they were pulling out was dependent on where the muon was along um, the, the, the magnet. 
So it added a, another layer of difficulty in calculating what that anomalous magnetic moment was because we essentially needed to know specifically where it was around that ring. <clears throat> So in 1997, BNL took up the torch and it moved from uh, injecting pions, which was done in the CERN experiment, to injecting muons. It also moved from multiple magnets to one big ring magnet. It also added an electromagnetic kicker and it mapped the B field all around the ring so we knew exactly what the muon was feeling in regards to that magnetic field. And this led to a 14 time improvement on um, the CERN um, measurement. And now we're at Fermilab and we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. So here is the Feynman diagram baked breakdown of various quantum fluctuations to the muon g minus two factor. So this vertical photon here that you're seeing depicts the magnetic field um, that, that the muon is interacting with. And this first, sorry, where's my thing? And this first image right here um, is the Feynman diagram for when g is equal to two. These next three diagrams depict the quantum fluctuation effects resulting from electrodynamic contributions, electroweak contributions, and the hadronic contributions. And this total we call the quantum anomalies, and um, it is equal to g, um, g is equal to two times one plus a. Ooh, where's my mouse, there you go. So when you add up all of these contributions, these quantum anomalies, these quantum contributions, um, you get an equation for the muon anomalous magnetic moment, which is equal to g minus 2 over 2. So when we say muon g minus 2, the, the name of our experiment actually encodes the actual measurement that we're trying to pull out. <clears throat> So as experimentalists, we're honing in on the ways to measure a more precise muon anomalous magnetic moment. We saw that timeline from, you know, the 20s. Uh, our theory friends were dedicating their time on calculating a more precise standard model equivalent. And this has been a large undertaking from over 132 authors from 82 institutions across 21 countries. And their most recent results were published in 2020. And here you can see the value and the uncertainty of each of the contributions with the hadronic contributions having the largest uncertainty. And the reason for this is due to the fact that the hadronic structure is governed by the strong interactions. And this is difficult to calculate directly as we can't use um, perturbation theory, like what is done for the quantum electrodynamic and the electroweak contributions to uh, G minus two. Uh, and this, the reason why we can't use perturbation theory is because of the dependency on the virtual photon momentum for the hadronic contributions. Um, so the way this contribution is calculated is by integrating over all possible virtual uh, photon momentum. At momenta. <laughs> and uh, the current uh, hadronic vacuum polarization, this is the HVP, uh, the uncertainty on that is at 0.6% with a 0.37 parts per million precision. And then you have this hadronic light by light contribution, which is at 20% with a, a 0.15 part per million precision. Uh, so there are multiple ways to kind of um, attack or get at uh, the hadronic contributions. And um, one, of the, one of the ways is a data-driven approach that takes data from experiments that you see here, the, they're called uh, E plus E minus facilities, um, and they uh, fold that into their calculations. And they, they use inputs from all of these experiments. So it's, it's a very robust um, approach. <clears throat> so even with difficulties in calculating the hadronic contributions to the muon anomalous magnetic moment, 
Um, the theory community has been able to reduce the uncertainty significantly over the past 20 years, and the tension between experiment and theory still holds at 3.7 sigma. Um, so right here, this is the BNL um, experimental measurement of the muon G minus two muon on, on anomalous magnetic moment. And you can see here that there's still this tension, this difference between what the experiment is seeing and what the theory is predicting. And that's one of the main reasons why this is uh, so exciting is that for 20 years, there has been this anomaly that we haven't been able to explain away. Um, so Fermilab G minus two came, you know, came into the scene to try and see if it still sees it. <clears throat> So the story, however, is a little bit more complicated in the theory realm. Um, there are multiple ways to calculate the hadronic corrections. Uh, the first is using experimental data together with dispersion, which we talked about in the previous slides. And the second is using direct calculations of Euclidean, Euclidean lattice QCD. And the uncertainties on the second strategy are still larger than the data-driven approach at 2% for the HVP, hadronic vacuum polarization, and at 45% for the light-by-light uh, light, uh, contribution compared to, I think, 20% for HLBL. Um, so improving on these uh, direct calculations using uh, lattice QCD is a top priority for um, the, the theory community. However, <laughs> There was, a, we call it the BMW20 uh, result, and they have a lattice QCD calculation um, that wasn't statistically limited. So they had a larger computation um, capacity and were able to reduce the uncertainties due to um, statistics. And you can see that point right here, which, is reducing that tension between theory and experiment, right? So the theory community is really excited to see these calculations um, and is waiting on bated breath to see these calculations at different energy regimes so we can compare it to the data-driven approach that is robust and takes input from many, many experiments. Um, and yeah, so either way, whether or not we get closer or further away from um, the experimental results that we're seeing um, from the BNL G minus two experiment, um, these this either way could lead to potentially new physics because we're either not understanding something in theory or something in experiment is not calculated in our theory. <laughs> Um, so for the rest of this talk, however, I'm going to be using the recommended value from the theory initiative, which is the black data point um, that's labeled WP20. So this is from the white paper. Um, yes, so let me, okay, so. All of that said, one of my favorite quotes about this very exciting push-pull of the standard model um, uh, anomalous magnetic moment calculation is out of Quantum, Mag Quantum Magazine, and it states, but for the moment, the past 20 years of conflict between theory and experiment appear to have been replaced by something even more unexpected, a battle of theory versus theory. So it's really exciting. <laughs> Okay, so now let's go into uh, Fermilab's muon G minus two experiment. So the muon G minus two collaboration is uh, consists of seven countries, thirty three institutions, and over two hundred um, members. And the first uh, thing that I wanted to talk about is essentially the main limit that the BNL experiment had um, was statistics. So at Fermilab, we created a more intense beam, which has the capability of reducing that statistical uncertainty that we saw at BNL, which was 460 parts per million, down to 100 parts per million. 
So the first part of the muon g minus two experiment is getting muons to our storage ring. And uh, the way we do this is by creating a beam of muons. And that beam starts with eight GeV uh, protons. And the recycler then spits, splits the batches into four bunches with 16 fields every one and uh, 1.4 seconds. So you just saw them get split, right? And here is um, kind of the bunch structure of, of, of our G minus two beam. The next step is to collide each of those bunches with a nickel alloy fixed target. And you can see the photo um, right here. Uh, and this results in 3.1 GeV pions that are then selected and focused using a pulse magnet with a lithium lens. And you can see um, the, the before and after of the pion distribution um, after using the pulse magnet and lithium lens. And you can see that it's now a Gaussian centered around three, which for the G minus two experiment, we consider that a magic momentum because it reduces kind of the complexity of our measurement. The next step is that pions then decay in flight along the 279 meter transfer line <clears throat> um, which you just saw, and 80% of the pions decay in, and 95% uh, uh, polarized beam is achieved. And you can kind of see a depiction, uh, where is it, uh, right here, where um, the pions split, uh, sorry, the pions decay, and we get now 95% um, polarized and uniform um, muon beam. <clears throat> so lastly, once, you know, we have this, um, the, once the pions have decayed into muons, we circulate that bunch in a delivery ring four times, which I think we just saw in the, in the graphic, uh, and this is to remove any proton contamination that's still in the bunch. And down here in the photo, you can see that, you know, we enter we enter the delivery ring with muons and, and protons relatively close together. And as we circulate the bunch of, of, in the delivery ring, you start seeing a separation of the distributions and we're able to only have a very pure um, muon beam. So now we have um, a muon beam with 3.1 GeV over C <clears throat> and we essentially are ready to shoot it into our deliver our main ring. <clears throat> so now let's talk about that storage ring. Um, the storage ring was a $25 million magnet that BNL created. Uh, so it was more cost effective for the Fermilab G-2 team to actually move this magnet versus trying to remake it. Um, the the difficulty in that was that the ring is an exquisitely sensitive device. It can't be bent or twisted by more than a few millimeters. So that's one of the reasons why we had to put it on a barge um, and ship it around Florida to get to us. Uh, so this barge actually had four accelerometers and one tilt meter. Um, and if the water got too choppy, there was a satellite uh, there was a feed that went to a satellite modem that the engineer in charge had to make the call on whether or not we need to dock for the night or for the day until the waters got uh, more clear. So it was a really complex um, move with a lot of, you know, moving parts. <clears throat> and then once we got it to Fermilab, we had the daunting task of reassembling. And this is just a quick kind of, you know, reel that I'm just gonna, yeah, have it play while I take a little bit of water. Yeah, so we heavily relied on the expertise of technicians um, and engineers uh, to get the, you know, the storage ring 
assembled um, and cross our fingers that we didn't break it on the way, <laughs> on the way to Fermilab. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about all of these little pieces in the next couple of slides. Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit. How am I doing on time, y'all? I think I'm okay. Okay. Um, so the storage ring uh, that we're seeing here is a 50 foot diameter magnet. Um, it creates a 1.5 Tesla magnetic field. And it was really, really imperative that we got that magnetic field as uniform as possible around the ring so that we could reduce our uh, systematic uncertainties on our um, magnetic, muon uh, magnetic anomalous moment. <clears throat> so once the magnet was assembled, the process of shimming began. And I didn't know what shimming was until I got onto the G minus two experiment. Um, essentially, it's the technical term for when you have a wobbly table and you put a little piece of cardboard underneath the leg so that it levels out. That's essentially what we were doing with this magnet so that we get a uniform magnetic field. Um, and this is done by adjusting pole gaps, applying currents to cancel out field gradients. It, it gets real complicated. And, and all of this was done by simulating the magnetic field around the ring and calculating the different, you know, um, changes that that we needed to do um, at each step around the ring. So the G minus two storage ring is actually made up of what we call 12 C-shaped C yolks, which are uh, depicted right here. This is a cross, essentially a cross section of what you would see um, in our storage ring. And each yoke has six poles, three upper and three lower. And you see these poles right here. Um, and the top hats that are highlighted in red, these actually adjust the whole yoke by 30 degrees. So they move them um, in, in, in this direction. Um, and uh, we have 48 top hats in total. Then we have a pole pieces and shims were added above and below the pole pieces. And you can see, oh, where is my thing? See them right here and right here um, to uh, minimize the boundary discontinuities. So essentially um, there what is the, the high probability that our poles are going to be offset vertically from one another, which causes discontinuities in, and, and differences in our magnetic field. So we use this shimming where we kind of add, add metal pieces on the top and on the bottom of our pole pieces so that we get no discontinuities between the boundaries and they align perfectly. And down here is just the bottom of, of what a pole piece looks like. <clears throat> and then you have these wedges and these wedges move in and out for adjustments on a 10 degree section of the pole pieces. And we have um, 864 of these wedges and they essentially move our pole piece um, with an angle alignment. <clears throat> then you have laminations and this is where, this is all before my time and finding out about this blew my mind. So these laminations were computer simulated um, for all of the shimming that needed to happen around the ring, um, including the thickness of these laminations. So you can see a photo right here of a strip of these laminations and they literally look like little pieces of foil paper. <laughs> but each one of those little pieces of foil paper was uh, specifically calculated for the space that it was um, installed in so that you can reduce that the magnetic field variation. That, that just blew my mind. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, you have more of uh, what we call active shimming. So the surface coils, and you can see a photo of them right here, these are composed of two sets of 100 current carrying coils um, with varying radial dependence to minimize higher order field gradients. So you can see here that it's relatively um, uniform in the middle, but then you have these higher order gradients that are happening on the edge of, um, you know, the 
our storage uh, ring. And once you turn the surface coils on, you can see that a lot of these field gradients are minimized. So this work took over a year. <clears throat> and this is just a graphic showing the variation of the magnetic field and how we're getting the, the, the change um, as uniform as possible. And that blue line is the BNL uh, magnetic field. And we were able to get a threefold improvement in the overall magnetic field uniformity compared to the BNL experiment. <clears throat> so, a lot of work that paid off. So, now that we've assembled the magnet, have a, a uniform magnetic field, we can then shoot our muon beam into our storage ring. So it comes in, as you see highlighted here, um, at 3.1 GeV over C. And the first thing that it hits is the inflector. And the, what the inflector does is injects and deflects. So it injects the muons into our storage ring, and it also deflects the magnetic field that the storage ring is outputting or producing. Um, if we didn't have an equal but opposite sign magnetic field in the inflector, essentially the muons would try to get injected, hit that magnetic field, and fly out. So the injector is essentially the only way that we get uh, muons into our, into our storage ring. And I just want to kind of show the beam channel. Um, this is I think relatively uh, on the size of what that inflector looks like. It's a very, very small beam channel. So it's really, really important on the front end, on the accelerator side, that we get that muon as um, focused as possible, uh, the muon beam as focused as possible, so we could get muons actually to enter our storage ring. So the next thing the muons hit is called our electrostatic quads. And these are used for vertical focusing and cover about 43% of the ring. So when I say vertical focusing, what I mean is that it, it keeps the muons from spiraling up or down and out of our storage ring. <clears throat> and one of the issues that we had run in in our run one um, was that we had two damaged resistors um, that's in some of the quads, and that meant that the quads didn't stabilize before our fit start time and made uh, the vertical distribution of our beam shift down by around 0 0.6 millimeters. Uh, sorry, my dog's asleep and running in his sleep. <laughs> um, Anyways, this was fixed for run two, but this added another systematic that we needed to mitigate in our run one analysis. Shh, Daisy. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the way we mitigated this um, was actually to add this effect the effect of the damage resistors into our end-to-end -end simulation so we could pull out this systematic. And that was something that I was able to, to contribute to the run one measurement um, by adding this software uh, framework um, into our pre-existing um, simulation. So another thing we use the quads for is for scraping. And what that means is essentially scraping off the edge case muons. So think of our muon beam as like a living, breathing organism that can like, you know, move, move and grow and expand as it's going around um, the storage ring. So the, the, the quads scrape off the muons that are on the edge of that, you know, that living, breathing beam so that we can reduce um, muon losses because lost muons also affect our uh, measurement. Um, that's another systematic that we need to mitigate. So like um, you heard in my bio, I come from neutrino land. I did my graduate work on microboon and it was 
fully software related. So as a newly minted postdoc on the muon G-2 experiment, my first task was to help in the complete overhaul of the kicker system. Um, and for that reason, the kicker has a very special place in my heart. Um, and that experience allowed me to literally touch every aspect of the kicker subsystem and gave me insight to help in the development of a more robust monitoring system for the kicker and in upgrading our end-to-end -end simulation to account for real-world kicks. Um, and we use simulation again in the calculation of our systematic uncertainties. So there was high voltage limitations in run one, which means that the kick wasn't strong enough to get the muons to the correct orbit. Um, and we have essentially three kickers that are one, two, and three right here. And what the kicks, what the kicker does is just that. It kicks the whole muon beam onto the correct orbit so that we can store it um, in our storage ring. And in run one, like I said, the kick wasn't strong enough. Where is my, there it is. <clears throat> yeah, okay. I think, so just here you can see a picture of um, what our kickers look like. Uh, and theoretically, we would want the kick to be a, a smooth delta function, right? So that it kicks for the amount of time that the muon uh, beam is in that area and then turns off as soon as the, you know, the muon beam is out of that space. But unfortunately, you know, real world, world doesn't work like that. And the curvature actually of our um, kicker plates adds to this ringing effect that you see in this plot back down here. So this T0 pulse is actually when we have the timing of the, the muon beam. And for the most part, the kicker pulse, the largest kicker pulse aligns with when the, the beam is, is in that area. <clears throat> so the next thing we have are calorimeters, and these are made by nine by six lead fluoride crystals. Um, and as muons go around the ring, the spin vector rotates around its momentum vector, and you kind of see a depiction shown here. And after about 100 turns, that muon decays into uh, via the weak interaction, producing the positrons. And the positrons um, are measured by the calorimeter, um, their energy and time of arrival. Um, and this, you know, gives us insight on what the muons were doing within, within our storage ring. Uh, the calorimeters need to be calibrated to precisely understand the response of a positron entering them. Um, and we do that per crystal, per calorimeter, using a laser calibration system. Um, that you see in this photo. And this is used to quantify this systematic and helps in the calibration. And this calibration happens around every three days. So I'm kind of going through all of this so you can understand how meticulous every single sub, sub, subsystem um, measurement was taken so that we can precisely know what that uh, AMU, the uh, muon anomalous magnetic moment is. <clears throat> so this graphic right here is just showing the oscillation of the rotation of the spin vector around that momentum uh, vector. And um, in reality, this large sweep that you're seeing below our threshold energy isn't that big. And the threshold energy was chosen so that we can actually start seeing that oscillation that's happening with the spin going around the momentum. Um, so this is actual calorimetry data. Um, so this is the actual oscillation from a positron energy that we'd be seeing. And due again to that parity vi violation that the CERN experiments um, figured out. No, I'm sorry, the Nevis and, and um, Liverpool experiments. Uh, we can associate this oscillation, this wiggle of the positron energy back to uh, the muons. 
So now we have the trackers and these are located at 180 and 207 degrees around the ring. And they measure the trajectory of the decay positrons. Um, they're composed of little straws with a 15 micron wall thickness and they have a 125 millimeter hit resolution. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, you know, a picture of what they look like. And you can see that we have straws going, you know, in this direction, in this direction, so we can get like a 2D um, a visual of the trajectory of those positrons. And the trackers are used to track the, like I said, that breathing and, and movement of the beam. Um, there are horizontal and vertical betatron oscillations that happen. And betatron oscillations is what you're seeing, that, you know, movement in this you know, the horizontal direction and the, the spreading in the vertical direction. And these are due to the fact that one, we don't have a monoenergetic beam. It comes in with a, a you know, a spread, a distribution of energy. Um, and then also because of the effects of our quads and our kickers. <clears throat> so now let's get into the analysis and I'm gonna kind of go through this pretty quickly. So we have the cyclotron frequency, um, which is the momentum vector precession in a un uniform magnetic field. And then we also have the spin precession frequency that you see here. And the way we get omega A um, is by subtracting these two frequencies. And when omega A is equal to zero, the momentum and the spin vector align all the way around the ring and everything is, you know, hunky-dory. But when omega A doesn't equal to zero, and this is just um, what you, this equation that you're seeing here is just a substitution of variables, you get um, what A mu is equal to, the anomalous magnetic moment. And this, this is our bread and butter. This is what we want, right? Um, so when it doesn't equal to zero, you start seeing that oscillation. You start seeing the spin vector rotating around the momentum vector. Uh, so what muon g minus two is doing is measuring omega a, which is that wiggle that we saw in the calorimeter um, to a very, very high precision, and also measuring the, mag the magnetic field that the muons are feeling also to a very high precision. Uh, rearranging the equation, substituting some um, um, uh, variables, <laughs> a substitution of variables from experiments um, that already have measured these to high precision. This is the equation that we get for the anomalous magnetic uh, muon moment. So these ratios right here, they're measured by experiments that you can uh, read about, and they're measured to less than 22 parts per billion precision. Um, you have the proton Larmar precession frequency in a spherical water sample that we'll touch on in a little bit. And then you also have um, the omega A and this ratio seems pretty simple enough. That's, that's what we're trying to pull out of our data analysis. Um, yeah, and I've talked about, you know, all of the kind of hints of that it, it's not that simple. Um, that ratio actually breaks down to this. <laughs> um, and we're going to essentially step through each of these variables and talk about what each of them are. So uh, you have uh, the unblinding factor here, which we'll talk about in like two minutes. Uh, the muon precession frequency, which we've already touched upon. And then we have beam dynamic corrections here. So this all of these corrections are in part due to the fact that we don't have a monoenergetic beam, due to the fact that, you know, um, we have a living, breathing uh, beam in our storage ring um, and, you know, other issues like that. Uh, you also have this calibration factor, which again, we'll touch upon. And then we have a beam weighted uh, magnetic field. So not only do we have um, an idea of the magnetic field, we also weight it by the, the, the distribution of the beam. And then lastly, we have these transient field corrections that are due to 
the quads and to the kickers. So all of these corrections and systematic uncertainty calculations led to four journal articles, one dedicated to uh, AMU, and the other three detailing our beam dynamic corrections, our omega A corrections, and the magnetic field measurement and corrections. So the first is omega A, and we've already talked about what, what that entails. <clears throat> This plot right here, again, is um, all of the callos. And you can see not only do you have that oscillation that's happening, but you also have this exponential decay. And that is due to the fact that you're going to have less muons going around the ring as the muons decay. <clears throat> and again, we've already seen this plot, so I'm going to step through it. But that wiggle essentially is, this is what we get. We get the wiggle plot. And to get omega A, you wanna fit this data. <clears throat> so we fit it, we get residuals, we take a, a Fourier transform of the residuals and we see these you know, frequencies that are, uh, these peaks that don't align with um, you know, what we're trying to, trying to get. So the next step is to try and mitigate these um, residuals. And the way we do that is to take tracker information so that we can understand um, and fit this uh, betatron oscillations that are happening in the vertical and in the, the uh, radial um, positions. So once we do that, we get uh, essentially a 22 parameter fit that you can see uh, here and it's in the paper. Uh, all of the residuals are reduced. You have a chi-squared close to one and everything you know, is beautiful. So this is done <clears throat> by using three different techniques for getting omega A and 11 different uh, independent analyses. There was also a software blinding uh, frequency that was added to each analysis in runs 1B through 1D. And that unblinding uh, frequency was different than the one in 1A because we unblinded 1A to you know, uh, make sure that everything was, was um, as it should be. <clears throat> so those are the different um, colors that you're seeing. The colors are for the different run, the different subsets in run one, B, C, and D. And then each of the columns that you're seeing are the different analysis techniques um, that, that were done by different analysis groups. So the first step in making sure that we're on the right track was to reduce or to remove that software unblinding frequency. And when we did that, Thankfully, <laughs> all of the uh, analyses lined up. Um, and so that essentially is showing us that by doing 11 different analyses techniques, so essentially getting omega A in 11 different ways with different software and blindings, once we remove that, we're still on, on, on the same track. So everything's looking good. <clears throat> So systematic uncertainties were calculated and for each of the run, the subsets in run one, you can see what the, the uncertainties were down here. So now let's talk about what we call the E-field and pitch correction. Um, <clears throat> So the differences in the equilibrium radius, radius that you're seeing on the left plot are mainly due to the fact that we had different running conditions for the kicker over the different subsets. Like I said, we had, um, the kicker is a teenager <laughs> and it had a lot of um, angst during run one that we had to uh, mitigate. It was really unstable and you know the kicks were different um, so one of the things that we had to mitigate to try and attack this uncertainty was implement a framework where we can switch between the real world kicks in our simulation um, so that we could uh, calculate that systematic. And, and, and that was one of the things that I was also able to, to, to develop for this run one analysis. Um, so this pitch correction is due to the vertical 
betatron motion of the beam. And it's created um, due to when, um, due to the electrostatic quads. So when the quads uh, are pulsed to, um, re you know, reduce that, uh, reduce the muons leaving the, the storage ring. Um, uh, okay, let's, um, so the pitch correction also had to uh, take into account the, the effects of the damaged resistors. Um, so that made, you know, this correction a little bit more complicated and had a higher systematic uncertainty due to that. But like I said, that was uh, fixed for the rest of the runs. So next you have the muon loss correction, and this encompasses three factors. Uh, the rate of the muon loss, so how many muons are lost as the muons are going around the ring. Uh, the phase momentum correlation, so whether or not the, the lost muons have a correlation between their phase and, and their momentum, and then the correlation between lost muons and momentum. Uh, so the population of stored muons, like I said, is depleted only by decays. Um, but the population of muons that will be lost is depleted at a faster rate due to not only the decays, but also the losses. Um, so the stored and lost muon populations have different momentum distributions. And so the different rate of depletion creates this time-dependent average of the muon momentum. And this needs to be mitigated. Um, you also have this spin momentum correlation that will combine with this time-dependent muon losses to produce this time-dependent phase. Um, and then you have right here is the phase momentum correlation. And this is actually data-driven, where we uh, shifted the momentum of our beam um, lower and higher from, from you know, where uh, the nominal momentum beam is to actually see this phase momentum correlation. And then we fit this data to get the corrections um, associated with this, this correlation. And then the last factor is uh, the lost muon momentum correlation. And again, this was data driven. And what we did was reinsert the damage resistors from 1-1 one one, um, during a systematic run and inserted collimators. So that increased uh, the amount of muons lost. Uh, and then we shifted the momentum higher and lower to see um, how those changes were associated uh, with time. And you can see that uh, for low momentum muons, their loss is dis disproportionately higher um, at early times than the higher momentum muons. So, uh, like I said, because of the damage resistors, we had uh, the beam narrowing in time. And you can see that uh, right here, where the early phase beam is a wider Gaussian, but then as a uh, uh, Later in time, you get this more narrowing of the beam. So we use um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. So we use this tracker data, um, and we combine that with um, what we call phase acceptance maps to get this correction. And what phase acceptance maps are are field maps that we take. Um, at different cross sections all around the ring. So we um, combine these two to get this um, um, map to, to, to pull out the correction for, for the phase acceptance. Uh, okay, so doing all of that um, for all of the corrections, you can see here the statistical and systematic uncertainties for omega A, as well as the correction terms and the uncertainties associated with those. Um, so that is the numerator. So I'm gonna go really, really quickly um, over the, the denominator. So this frequency calib uh, calibration um, is actually, you can see here, 
we um, use protons in a nuclear magnetic resonance sample and then align these with an external magnetic force. We then add an RF coil, which tips the magnetization of the sample 90 degrees and then remove um, that and allow um, a free induction decay to happen in that sample. And then we fit to extract this frequency. And this gives us information on the magnetic field. Uh, so we use this calibration to calibrate all of the nuclear magnetic resonance probes that we have inside what we call this trolley and also at uh, um, 9,000 locations around uh, the ring. No, I'm sorry, 378 fixed uh, probes around the ring. And then this trolley takes measurements 9,000 uh, locations around the ring. So you can see that we get what we call these field maps right here. And then we can convolute these to get what we have right here, which is the, the total uh, mapping um, of the magnetic field. Uh, where's my, I'm running close on time. Where are we? Um, so I'm going to skip this. This is uh, corrections due to the quads and to the kickers. Uh, the reason why we needed a, a quad correction is because one of the awesome but uh, difficult things is that when the quads were pulsed, it created a mechanical vibration that then induced a transient field that was in time with the muon beam that was coming through. So this needed to get mitigated. Um, and you can, you know, see the difficulties in that. And then lastly, when you um, turn the kicker on, it also induces eddy currents that we needed to measure um, to, to mitigate that systematic as well. So that's a lot, right? Um, you can see the correction terms and the uncertainties for all of the, um, you know, calibrations. Um, uh, in the denominator, and you know, that's it, right? Actually, no, there was a whole bunch more systematics that we had to um, mitigate. And these are just tables that you can find in, you know, the four articles uh, that were submitted for both um, corrections in the denominator and in the numerator. And this is uh, a, essentially a screen grab from our uh, paper. And we had a 462 part per billion overall error with a 434 PPB statistical and 157 parts per billion systematic error. And that is almost half of the BNL systematic error, but it's not yet at our goal of 100 parts per billion. So we need to reduce that by 57 parts per billion to actually get to where um, we want to get to. So the total uncertainty of the BNL measurement was at 540 parts per billion. Um, and now the standard model calculation uncertainty is at 360 parts per billion. So there's a lot of work that needs to get done um, to reduce that, uh, that uncertainty so that we can compare to the standard model calculation. Um, we, uh, we plan on getting 20 times uh, the BNL statistics, and we aim to get, like I said, um, the systematics down to uh, 140 parts per billion, which will be four times better than the current theory calculation, and we are on track to get to, get to that, to our TDR. So the results, I mean, you've heard them, you know it, <laughs> uh, but the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the re a really innovative way that we blinded our uh, results. And that is with this clock frequency. So we had a 10 megahertz GPS clock that measured both the omega A and the omega P frequencies. And we added a hardware blinded frequency um, for the omega A and only two non-collaboration members pictured here knew what that, uh, what that clock was set to. Um, and the uncertainty of this clock 
is about two parts per billion. So on February 25th, on a Zoom call with over 170 collaborators, we voted unanimously to unblind that clock. And the results were, and it was really, it's like, <laughs> Um, really exciting because we already had a Python script ready to go to implement this, you know, clock frequency so we could instantaneously get the, the result of G minus two. Um, and what we saw was that the Fermilab G minus two experiment confirms the BNL experimental results almost 20 years later. And the tension between the standard model and the experiment grew. Um, the green point right here is the standard model. Um, model recommended by um, the white paper, the theory initiative. Um, and just to kind of uh, underscore the, the excitement here is that the chance that this is a statistical fluctuation um, would be about one in 40,000. Um, so while we're not at the point where we can definitiv definitively say this is new physics, um, where will one in 40,000 chance that it may be something that we haven't seen before, physics beyond the standard model. And, um, you know, our theory friends took this and, and rolled with it. And if you look at, you know, the, the publications hours after um, the G minus two announcement, you can see so many um, hits in the archive. Um, and this um, tension, this, this difference between standard model and experiment could point to physics beyond the standard model like SUSY, uh, dark matter, uh, charge flavor, lepton dilation, and there's even um, theories that I've seen that uh, uh, combine lepto quarks uh, with, this, with this difference. So now what does the future hold? <clears throat> so like I said, run one uh, is done, and these are the results that we were talking about. This was only 6% of the full statistics, and we uh, ended with 434 parts per billion statistical with 157 parts per billion systematic error. For runs two and three, um, they are in progress the analysis is in progress, and we are looking at a twofold reduction in the total uncertainty. And the systematics uh, for runs one, two, and three is on track to be less than 100 parts per billion. And we actually just completed run four. Um, and we, in the future, are aiming for, like I said, 20 part. Uh, 20 times the BNL results. Uh, I think we ended run four at about 10 and a half times um, and a further twofold reduction in the error. <clears throat> so I can't cover all of the upgrades that happened between two and four. Um, I was part of the kicker team and there was a complete overhaul of the kicker. Um, we had uh, the damage resistors replaced in the quads. We upgraded the hall cooling because the variation in the temperature actually affects the, the magnetic field uniformity. So we upgraded the hall cooling and we also improved the way we map the field. Um, and these photos right here are just some of the work um, that I was a part of. Uh, one of the things that we had to mitigate was the fact that the kickers <clears throat> excuse me, the kickers were sparking, and we had to figure out why. Um, the We have a capacitor bank that holds the charge for the kickers. Those are also charring and needed to be replaced. And then our bloom lines were sparking because of the standoffs that held the concentric um, tubes inside of the main one was disintegrating because of the castor oil flow. So we had to completely take apart the balloon line, um, remove the castor oil, clean out the inside, polish each one of those concentric um, cylindrical tubes. It was a process, but now the kicker is top notch. 99% uptime, no sparking, kick right on point. Um, so it was a very um, fulfilling experience to be on the kicker team. Okay, 
Um, I am finished. I am so sorry I went over time. Um, hopefully there's still people in the audience <laughs> and I'm happy to answer questions. Hi, thank you a lot for your, your talk. Uh, do you want to, to organize this, the questions? Please. Okay, so no problem. So uh, if anybody has some questions, you could please uh, use this uh, rising hand from the Zoom or just write in the, in the chat and then we can, we can read. Okay, Gordon. I have one question. I have some. I was in the beginning of your talk, reality. You said in the beginning that you, you had some contamination of, of uh, protons in the beam. And after mm -hmm. you separate, you eliminate the protons. How you eliminate it? Because the velocity of it's different the beam. It's because the difference in uh, the mass of the particles. Um, so the our accelerator uh, division team actually calculated the specific amount of turns to separate the muon and the proton distribution um, due to you know that difference in 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 the mass um, and they settled on on four turns and you can actually see um, you know the <laughs> the beautiful separation that that occurs. Let me go back to mm -hmm. that photo. Yeah. Yeah. So even like at turn two, it's, you know, good enough, right? But mm -hmm. because of uh, the fact that we're a, you know, a ridiculously high precision experiment, we wanted to make sure that there was a big enough um, uh, spread in the timing of, of the muons and, and the proton distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe I have another question. There's a possibility, for example, of the contamination of immune so cosmic rays to hit in your experiment and, meets, and you mix this thing, or it's too low probability to interact? Because it's a, it's a at surface, you know, because it means that the parts of the atmospheric immune should be uh, very large. But I don't know, because the, maybe the timing you can separate this, I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I'm not sure. I'm relying on my background in neutrinos um, because that we had to mitigate cosmic rays all the time. And there is a spatial difference in um, the way, you know, the muons from our accelerator look in our um, uh, calorimeters versus the way a uh, uh, um, a cosmic ray would look. On top of that, we are very precise in the uh, the trigger, so the T0 of when the beam comes through, and we also know each timing of the bunches and the batches. So we are only looking at data within that specific uh, timing range. Um, and we also are informed by our trackers that give us the trajectory of those positrons. So. I, I don't think that it's something that we, I, I mean, I'm positive that it's something that we, that we have thought about and mitigated. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? George? Um, yeah, thank you very much. For, thank you very much for this really great talk. Um, just to say that, as you said, as, as I think you said, there is this, the theory uncertainty is much bigger than the experimental uncertainty, right? Because the lattice, now if there is a lattice group that claims that the standard model, the actual standard model result is within your error bars, right? Or it's very close mm -hmm. to your error bars. Yeah, definitely. But one of the, I mean, it's the hot topic of conversation, right? We're all waiting on beta breath to see what falls out within that theory group. But if you look at the BMW, um, point uh, back in 2019 when they first submitted um, their results and then in 2020 that the well one the statistical error bars 
were reduced, but also it moved from closer to the experimental result and shifted closer to the standard model. So there's still a lot of, um, a lot of questions uh, that folks are trying to answer with regards to, um, with regards to that. But it's really, really exciting to see, you know, uh, Euclidean lattice QCD um, and direct calculations of the hadronic, uh, you know, contributions actually work. <laughs> Um, I, I think that's really, really exciting, so. Systematics is as hard as experiment there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Any more questions? No? Orlando? Hi, hi, sorry. I have another question, Sidney. Uh, who you know the the stability of the magnetic field between the hands? Because, for example, I don't know how long is a run of the of the screen. How long is I, I don't know how long you will call a run one. A run one, for example, how long is in, in time? And if the magnetic field is stable all this time, or you need to, or if you have some, for example, fluctuation because the, the, the thing, where you can know that it is stable or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a great question, and I'm sorry I didn't touch upon that in, in, in my talk. Es essentially, the way we make sure that we know to a very high precision what the magnetic field is, is that that trolley that I showed you, um, you know, that car or whatever, we drive that around the ring and take measurements at 9,000 points around the ring every three days. Um, and then we also have the 378 fixed uh, NMR probes that are on the outside of the ring that are taking measurements continuously. So then we use, um, we essentially extrapolate the information that we get from that trolley run to the fixed probes um, so that we know exactly, um, well, to a very high precision, what the magnetic field is um, between those three days where we weren't, you know, taking measurements inside the vacuum. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 I understand, yeah, okay, okay. nice. Any more questions? No? Okay, so I think we can finish here. Uh, Jessica, thanks again for accepting our invitation for giving the talk, it was very nice. And that's it, so bye-bye everybody and see you next time. Bye, Jessica. Yeah. Okay, bye. thanks a lot thanks to Jessica for, for your talk. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.